I like to discuss topics related to infrared photography. In this video, I'll take a look at a vintage lens with a modern infrared converted camera. At the end of the video, I'll walk through the edit with one of these infrared images. The lens is a Nikon Nikkor N 24mm f2.8 non-AI, a manual focus lens. It has a 52mm filter thread, which is a great size for adding external filters. I purchased this from KEH in excellent condition for about 160 US dollars. The aperture for this lens works at full stop increments and has distinct clicks. A full turn of the focus ring is about 170 degrees. While most of the subjects for this shoot would have been at infinity for visible light, due to the focus differences in infrared, most of the subjects were actually focused at about 3.5 feet per the marker on the manual focus lens. Since it's a manual focus lens, I used focus peaking on my Fujifilm X-T20 with peaks set to blue. The adapter that I used is a Photodiox Pro Tilt Roker a tilt shift lens mount adapter that allows me to adapt Nikon lenses to a Fuji X mount body. This adapter cost about 165 US dollars. A regular adapter without the tilt shift capabilities can be had for under $15. I bought this lens and the adapter to use the tilt and shift features for these shots. I want to focus on the lens for this video, so I'll share using tilt shift with infrared in a future video. The camera that I used was converted to 590 nanometers. I used no external filters for the shoot, although you could certainly add a 720 nanometer or higher filter to get a different look. Some observations for the Nikon 24mm 2.8. First of all, it has no hotspots, so it makes a great lens for shooting in infrared. The image quality is similar to the Canon FD 24mm 2.8. The Nikon lens is slightly heavier than the Canon though. It has good contrast and great colors. The corners are soft with some chromatic aberration, but the softness emulates an infrared film look. And in many shots, I added negative clarity in editing, so the soft didn't bother me at all. I like the character of the lens flares. It has a six aperture blade, so produces hexagon shaped lens flares, but they're not overwhelming. You could avoid them by adding a hood, which I didn't use for this shoot. So let's take a look at editing one of the images shot with the Nikon 24mm in Adobe Lightroom. So first thing I want to talk about is lens corrections. When you're working with a modern lens, camera will be able to record data about that lens and then automatically assign a lens correction. But in this case, because there's no automatic connectivity between a vintage lens and the camera, Lightroom doesn't know which lens you're using and cannot apply corrections. But if you choose to, you could apply corrections manually. This is a choice. You could accept the distortion and vignetting that comes with the lens, and that's perfectly acceptable, or you could correct them. So I'll show you how you could correct them for this particular lens. So I will enable profile corrections, and then I'll come down to make and select Nikon and then model. And this is where it's a little tedious because this user interface doesn't really deal with having a long list of lenses very well. Okay, so there we go. So now I can get down to the older lenses, the non-autofocus lenses. So I've got the Nikkor 24 millimeter here and I'll select that and you'll see that immediately there's a little bit of distortion correction and vignetting correction so the edges aren't so dark and the distortion has been corrected so again that's a choice you can make when you are working with a vintage lens you can either find a similar profile that's available and use that or you can choose not to make those corrections at all that's perfectly acceptable as well so when we're working in Lightroom with an infrared image there's two problems that Lightroom doesn't deal with well one of them being white balance as we, if we look at the temperature slider, we have a limited range. We can get down to about 2,000. Gets us pretty close to separating out some of these colors. If we go in the other direction, then not so much. So we've got a white balance problem that we need to address. And then the second problem is that normally you would have to use another program like, say, Photoshop and apply an adjustment layer of a channel mixer or an invert in order to swap the colors. But we want to do all of that in Lightroom so that we're not jumping between programs and we can keep everything in our one raw file. So what I want to do is go to Profile. And I have created a number of profiles that solve both of these problems. So they're a profile that both adjusts the 
slider to give you more flexibility within Lightroom for the temperature. And then they also do either a channel mixer or an invert. So it's basically taking the adjustment layer from Photoshop and sort of baking that into a LUT and then combining that with a profile and then that all appears here. So I'll put a link at the top of the screen that can show you how to create these profiles. It takes a little bit of time the first time you're doing it, but it really simplifies your workflow and allows you to keep everything in Lightroom if you so choose. Going over to Photoshop is a fine way to get more power and more control, but you may not want to do that for every image you work on. So let's pick one of these. I will select the channel mixer. I've created a few. I've created a, a channel mixer and invert for 590 and I've created one of each for 720. In this case, I'll select the channel mixer 590. I'll hit close and now I can use the white balance picker to select my white balance. And so you've got some choices here. You could select the grass, which is a different color than the trees, or I could select the clouds. The clouds are a little wispy. I don't know if I'll get it. There's enough there. So in this case, I think I'm going to go with the grass and that will get me a good color. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is address the contrast of the image. If you look at the histogram in the upper right hand corner, you'll see that the bulk of What's being highlighted here is in the middle of the image. There's very little in the deep shadows, the blacks. There's very little in the highlights, and that's kind of reflected in the image. It's a bit flat. So we're gonna, we've are gonna we got a variety of tools that we can use to address this. First of all, I'll come down to the tone curve, and I will select strong contrast. Then I'll go back to basic. I will increase the contrast. I typically, for infrared images, find myself somewhere around 25 to 30, but of course it's going to vary depending on the image itself. I will bump up the exposure just slightly. Want to get this uh, the bulk of this uh, histogram sort of in the middle as a good starting point. I can always come back and adjust that later. And then the other thing that I'll typically do is look at clarity and dehaze. So if I increase the clarity a little bit, that'll give me a little contrast in the midtones, and dehaze will give me a good amount of contrast as well. But you want to be have a bit of a light touch with the dehaze. Too much can be very strong. So I tend to go much lighter on that. Okay, now that I've addressed the contrast, the next thing is to look at the colors. And there's a few tools that I can use for the colors. So the most common ones will be, of course, your uh, vibrance and saturation. But if I want to manipulate the colors, I can use the HSL capabilities and I can also use calibration. So let's start in calibration and start to make some changes here. I kind of like the blue yellow uh, look for this. So I'm going to have to tweak this a bit to get there. We'll start down in the blue primary hue and I'll bring that down a little bit. What this will do is we'll take the sky a bit from teal towards a blue color that I want. I want more of a natural blue color for the sky here, and it also take a little bit of the orange out of the trees here to get more of a yellow look. So I definitely like the way that that looks. Okay, so I've made some changes to calibration. Now I wanna go and fine tune in HSL. So let's start with the sky. So I'll come up to the sky. Typically what I will do, you can work with the sliders, but because the channel mixer profile with the LUT baked into it that I'm using will swap colors, I find it's a lot easier to just use the picker and then I can go and directly select the color that I want and make the changes. So if I want to darken the sky slightly, I have luminance selected, I have the picker, I will pick the sky, drag down, and then you'll see that this affects mostly the orange and a little bit of yellow. So I can make those changes directly to the sky. Maybe I'll reduce the saturation just a hair, but I think that's pretty good. I think the hue is already good. All right, now let's look at the yellows of the tree. I want to increase the saturation there and maybe drop the luminance. So I'll click there, increase the saturation a bit. You'll see that that predominantly affects the blue and aqua, and that's good. And then I'll go to the luminance side and I will drop this a bit. All right, that looks pretty good. Now, one thing you've got to be aware of when you're when you're uh, making adjustments based on this, and you can kind of see it a little bit here, is there can be a, a fringing problem that can occur. So if I come to luminance and I pick the sky, let me let me zoom into this tree where we can really see the problem. You start to see some fringing, color fringing around the edge, and that's normal. That's there normally, but if I change the background too dramatically, then it'll stand out. So for example, if I take the luminance and I really want to darken the sky. 
sky to get a really bold and dramatic effect. That looks really good. However, now this fringing, this color fringing that exists on the tree is going to become very prominent. You're going to have to just kind of pay attention to that, especially in borders between the sky and the ground. You can see a little bit of it over here. So even though I would really love to darken the sky up really dramatically and have it have some punch, uh, because of the changes that HSL is making, I want to be careful of this. So I'm going to I'm going to reduce the impact of this a little bit. I'll just reset the values and I'll kind of start again. And what I'll typically do is make changes slightly. And if I start to see too much of that fringing occurring, then I might back off a bit. If I want to have a more dramatic look uh, and, I, and I don't want to see that fringing, then I might go over to Photoshop where I have more powerful tools that I can use. Okay, so I've got the colors largely where I'd like to see them. Uh, the next thing I want to do is address some of the spots in the image. So we have some spots that were appearing with this lens. I'm not sure if they were dust related or if they were some spots on the lens themselves. You can see. So what I like to do is come in to uh, zoom in a little bit and then use Use the spot removal tool which is Q uh, sometimes you can use you can click the visualize spots or hit the a key to visualize spots and then use this slider to affect how it uh, the image appears but in this case this really isn't helping me to identify those spots so that's not much help so I'll click a to undo that and I can just kind of visually look at these spots so I will work with my I'm scrolling my mouse wheel to increase the size and I will attack these three spots that I see here. And then what I'd like to do is use my mouse to go over to the navigator and move around the screen slowly to see if I can identify any other spots in the image. And actually here is, it looks like there's a spot here. This is probably actually a bird as opposed to dust, but it's very far in the distance and it looks like a little bit of a smudge. So I'll just get rid of that and then I can continue my browsing of the image to look for spots. Oh, here's another one. They're very faint uh, in this case. I think it's something related to the lens. I haven't quite identified if it's dust or uh, that I had for this particular shoot or or if it's just a, a flaw in the lens. I'm not really sure yet, but not too bad to clean up. Let me finish my tour here and make sure I've got all of the spots. Yep, so that's good. So I've got all the spots covered. I can hit done. Now I really like the direction that this image is heading, but there's a lot of distracting elements in the image. I really want to focus on this hillside and the tree and some of these supporting elements, but I find that the ground here on the left is very distracting. Uh, some of these plants are distracting and this tree poking in from the right hand side is a bit distracting. So what I want to do is see if I can correct those also in Lightroom. If I was going over to Photoshop, I could use uh, the tools there. Uh, and if you have to do some more advanced healing, then Photoshop may be the way to go. But this is uh, something that I think I could tackle here in Lightroom. So I'm going to give it a try. So we'll use the spot removal tool again. But instead of looking at spots, I'm going to actually draw and pick up a larger area. So that gets rid of that branch. Um, and you can start to see uh, some of the softness of this, uh, of this particular lens here as we get into the corner zoomed in. So I will take this out. It's not quite as powerful or smart as the healing brush in Photoshop, so I will probably tackle this in segments because then it's a little bit easier to manage. It's just going to grab another area. And then you have some choices here when you're doing this. You can either, for a particular segment, you can either clone that or heal. I find heal works great a lot of the time, but if you're if you're on a part of the image that isn't working well, you can try both. All right, so that takes care of cleaning up that branch. Let's head over to the left side of the screen and tackle some of these things. So the first thing I want to do is get this patch of ground. It's not adding a lot of value and it's just distracting. So I'll go with a much bigger spot and we will drag, maybe grab this here and see, and that clones pretty well. I'm getting a little bit of this spot, although it's kind of matching the ridge line pretty well. So that's really not so bad. Uh, if I pick up some of these smaller spots, I can take some of these out as well, some of these colors. I want a little bit of, of stuff down here, but I really don't want the these distractions to to distract oh so that's a that's kind of a bad call there for where that's getting its its call from we're gonna zoom out and then I can pull in this and pick a spot down here that's closer so that we get a better match I'll go back to one to one and I can start to tackle some of these other spots I don't like how it picked up this black spot here so we'll get that swapped out 
Um, and then I could actually even go in and address some of these uh, sort of dead weeds here if I wanted to eliminate some of those if I, if I thought those were distracting. So there's some basic things that you can do within Lightroom that are not quite as uh, powerful and capable as the heel brush in Photoshop. But again, if you're working on an image and you want to avoid that round trip, then there's certainly some capabilities here. And now we can see that we've still got some detail over on the left, but it's just a little bit more uniform and a little less, dis less distracting. So in addition to that, I think I will take a graduated filter and run a graduated filter up the left side as well and darken this uh, set of grass to just sort of reduce the emphasis so that the eye is, is not drawn to it as much. So that, that's drawn away from that. The other thing I want to do a little bit of dodging and burning here so I can take a the brush tool, the adjustment brush, and I'm going to set this to darken. And what I'd like to do is darken up this tree on the left so that it kind of matches the one on the right so that there's a little bit... Uh, more uniformity there between the two of them. And I might pick up some of the highlights here and draw, drag this down as well just to uh, subdue this a little bit. Because again, I want the focus of this shot to be more on this tree on the hill. That's a look at using a vintage lens, the Nikon Nikkor N 24mm f2.8 adapted to a modern mirrorless camera converted to infrared, in this case, the Fujifilm X-T20 converted to 590 nanometers. Of course, you could convert this lens to any other mirrorless camera, you just need to get the appropriate adapter. Do you have any topics related to infrared photography that you'd like to see addressed? Leave a comment below. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.